captured the mood. There's a nice bike. The bike's part of the family. The Place Beyond the Pines is one of the most criminally underrated movies I've seen. I should be around him. I wasn't around my dad with the fucking way I turned out. It's a story about legacy, about what we pass on. The concept that we can make a choice and then generations later, the repercussions of that choice are still affecting the ones we love. It brings to life the inevitable passing of the torch that comes with parenthood in three separate acts, distinct through their protagonists, but connected by the consequences of their events. The film's director, Derek C. in France, decided early on that the film should be told linearly. When I first sat down with my co-writer, Ben Cochio, we decided on uh, chronology. We decided on to tell a movie, uh, you know, in a linear fashion. But I thought the bravest choice we could make with this film was to tell it in, in chronological order. Doing so means there are no intercuts, no flashbacks, no directorial shenanigans. The film is a direct pattern of causality from the previous event to the next. You know something, Luke? If you ride like lightning, you're gonna crash like thunder. So how can an abstract idea, an emotional connection, be built between characters who remain almost entirely separate from each other for the film's two and a half hours? And how can that connection be communicated with the audience if the two characters have little to no interaction on the screen? Why does Luke feel hauntingly present in the third act of the film, despite being dead for 44 minutes? Because C in France does this. What I'm calling visual ghosts are intentional similarities in characters and how they're presented that help communicate the film's theme of legacy. It's a moving viewing experience, brought to life through recurring motifs and locations, which captures the ripples caused by the first act of the film. These can be as simple as the patchwork of Jason's clothing echoing his father's tattoos, and as complex as compositional choices when presenting separate scenes. Using this technique, C in France connects Luke and his son through their characters and their behaviors, instead of their relationship. I want to take care of my son, that's my job. Let me do my job. Okay, how, how are you going to take care of him? He connects their flaws and their crimes. He connects their love for riding and the escapism it provides. And he connects their values and their insecurities, all of which help bring to life the abstract idea of legacy and fate. What? Some of these links are overt, like the ones drawn between Luke's arrest and Jason's 15 years later. The mirrored composition helps us to respond emotionally by comparing the downfall of both characters, but also communicates the idea that Jason is trapped behind the bars of his father's choices. Or here, where Jason visits the trailer where his father lived some 15 years ago. The two scenes almost interact with each other, speaking volumes in their subtext. The visual language transports us back, letting us in on an intimate connection between separate moments in time. You can almost feel Luke's presence, despite him being gone for 15 years and off screen for over an hour. You were standing right where your dad used to stand and we used to talk. He was a good guy, your dad. And the moment itself is only made possible because Luke forgot to bring his sunglasses on his last heist, leaving them in his trailer for them to be found by his son after all this time. The connection we feel here, it's palpable and heartbreaking. Why don't you put the glasses on? For sure, he would have said they were left there for you. Yeah. 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 You're calling him back. <laughs> But it doesn't take full scenes to reaffirm the connection between Luke and Jason, even fleeting moments call to their bond, like the similarities shared here. Small moments like these happen constantly throughout the film, with this one in particular both connecting Luke and Jason through their feeling of alienation, and emphasizing the strain that Luke has caused on Romina's life. See in France doesn't only use this technique to connect characters, 
but also to separate them. Take this scene, where Jason eats ice cream for the first time, and contrast it to this one, which takes place at the same location. There's something instinctively wrong about the second scene because of the importance of the first and what it meant to Luke. Wanna give him ice cream? Yeah. I'm gonna do something with him that's his first time. I'm gonna look in his face when he tries ice cream. Every time he has ice cream for the rest of his life, he's gonna see my fucking face. It's the reason we know that Kofi's speech on fatherhood doesn't land, despite it never being said. It isn't the dialogue that tells the story here, it's the location and the memory. Avery and his son AJ are also weaved into the ripples caused by the film's first act. The reason Avery never connects with AJ on an emotional level is because of his guilt, which has a profound impact on their relationship. I have a, I have a hard time... looking at my son. Take these two scenes. By setting them both at a pool, C in France contrasts the strength of Avery's relationship with his dad and the distance between him and his son, which is once again communicated without dialogue. And despite AJ's rebellion being a consequence of this disconnect, this refusal of love, he can't help but behave like his father. We see it when Avery lies to his therapist. You think you're ready to go back? To duty? Yes. Which is then echoed when AJ joins Schenectady High School. Did you want to come here for your senior year? I don't know. Yeah, uh, nah. We see it again when AJ violently beats Jason at a party, whose bloodied face throws us right back to Luke's after being shot. If you rewatch The Place Beyond the Pines, you'll find many more examples of these visual ghosts that breathe life into the film's thematic of legacy and freedom. There's a haunting quality to these moments, bringing back the memory of a person that once was and the consequences of his actions. The technique executes the difficult task of bringing abstract concepts we are familiar with to the medium of film. And it all culminates to the film's ending, which to me is one of the best I've seen. On one end, you have Avery's redemption, a journey that began with a mistake that he couldn't atone for. Avery finds forgiveness through his confrontation with Jason and allows himself to begin mending his relationship with AJ, who in turn follows in his footsteps. On the other end, you have Jason's growth, who only through discovering the connection he had to his father is able to break his cycle of self-destruction and is finally able to leave the place where so many others are stuck. I'll end this with the image of the opening credits, which to me beautifully capture the film's themes. Luke rides into the cage first, trailed by the two riders representing the many characters of the film. And as they begin their dance, they have no other choice but to follow him, driven by his performance but never intersecting, poetically encapsulating the events that are set in action throughout the film. Hey guys, not much to say here beyond if you're gonna watch this movie, bring a box of tissues. This one really hit me on an emotional level. It's one of those films that captures our vulnerabilities and our fears and amplifies them in an honest light. If you like this movie, check out Blue Valentine by the same director and be ready for another emotional roller coaster. That's it for me. Thanks for checking out my video. I'm Take Two, and I'll see you next time. Thanks.